Jesus commissions harvesters and laborers to go whether, where he would go and do what he would do. Risking hardship and danger in exchange for the experience of great joy, they offer peace and healing as signs that the reign of God is near. A reading from Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed out 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in prayers to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares the pe in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe it off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects me, whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please be seated. It was the summer of 1970. My parents, my brother, my sister and I piled into our white 1968 Plymouth Fury station wagon for a 10-day road trip around Lake Superior. Nine places, nine uh, stops for the night in 10 days. It wasn't until I had kids of my own that I realized how courageous my parents were. <laughs> how many of you have ever taken a road trip with kids? I have several times, and I live to tell the tale. Two I remember well. 1997, 10 days, four locations, and 1998, 12 days, three locations. Besides how to pack really, really well, and be very, very careful about what you leave behind, Two things I remember in particular. Travel light and don't move around once you've settled. This week's gospel reminded me that what I learned on my trips is biblical. Today Jesus sends out 70 or so of his disciples in all directions to heal and to evangelize people, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. What he said to them and how they went out is good advice for us and for our church. Jesus tells us the best way to take a road trip, go to church, or even raise a family. So what exactly did Jesus say? Let's look at the text a little more carefully. Jesus said to take no bags, not even sandals. By that he meant take no great possessions. Now people back in then had a lot fewer possessions than we do now, but that advice holds today. Why is that so important to keep your possessions to a minimum? Well, if you're on the road, there's nothing much to steal. Without possessions, they were dependent on God more, on the graces of other people, and probably most importantly, at least for people who travel, there's not much to lug around. How does this apply to us and to our churches? Well, 
If we focus on the things we have in this lifetime, we miss the point of the gospel. Without possessions, we are freer to focus on God. This is just as true for churches as it is for individuals. Let me explain. When in the life of a church does a church grow the fastest? According to David Olson, a church growth expert, most times it's in the first 30 years of its existence. In the first 30 years of a church, there is lots of energy and excitement. Why? In part because when a church starts, members are focused on growth and outreach. People are excited about building something new and different for God. Little of the energy and money goes into paying for and maintaining a building. Most of the time, a new church has no building. So how does this relate to Salem? Now this church is built, should we tear it down so we can focus on evangelism? Of course not. But we should use the existing building wisely, so we spend no more than we must on it. No more energy, no more time, no more money than we have to. That's a good way. That's a godly way to live. What else did Jesus say to his disciples? Jesus said to take no purse, no money for the journey. Does that mean we should never save money? Of course not. But it means that we must never let our wealth stand in the way of the gospel. If we focus on our money more than our faith, whether as individuals or as a church, we are in danger of making money our God. Worse yet, if we do succeed and have lots of money, it can be a problem. We can even come to believe that we can get by without God. When that happens, a church, lovely as it is, becomes no more than a social club. What else can we learn from Jesus in our gospel lesson today? Jesus sent us out in pairs. There is something encouraging in journeying with like-minded people. An important task is easier and better with the help and support of others. There are no Lone Ranger Christians, not really. We are all part of a community, living and dead, and even one other Christian can help us along on a journey. If you go it alone, sooner or later, you burn out. A community working together can accomplish a lot more. How about moving from house to house? What does Jesus mean about that? It means that when you're evangelism, you don't focus on getting close to people who are rich. That's what there was a the danger of doing. Find one house, the first thing, so you'll be certain to have a place for the night, and then find out there's somebody richer and go to that person's house for hospitality. There's a reason that there are very few ways to say pandering to the rich people in English without being vulgar. Everyone knows it's wrong. Few people like it when other people do that. And certainly God doesn't like it. It also means that we as Christians should help others because we are called to, and not because of our own glory, and not because of our own social status whether in the church or out. But evangelism is not just a subject we talk about whenever a gospel lesson comes up about evangelism. Evangelism is something we have to do. Let's be honest. This church has lost members over the last few years. That's sad, but before we get into a pity party, I want to tell you that a lot of that is normal. When a denomination gets embroiled in theology, like happened in the 09 sexuality vote, it's normal to lose members. When a church builds a new building, not everybody is on board, and it's normal to lose members. When a long-term pastor leaves, someone can't imagine that church without the beloved pastor. Some people may not have even been in the church before that pastor. Again, it's normal to lose members. In the entire ELCA, and even the whole 
American Christian Church, taken as a whole, year after year, in this day and age, it's normal to lose members. Few American churches are growing. But normal isn't the way things should be. When it comes right down to it, we are no different than the 70 set out 2,000 years ago. Jesus sends us modern disciples out every day, every hour, into the world to share the good news about God's love. We go out to welcome new members every day. Not to fill committees, not to maintain a budget, or continue paying off the mortgage. Not even to have bigger, more fun worship on a Sunday morning. If that's our motivation, we may build a great social club, but it's not a church. No, we reach out because faith changes lives. People who go to church live longer. People who go to church are happier. People who go to church make the world a better place to live. We are the salt of the earth. We reach out because Jesus calls us to reach out. Now, it is tougher for a church to grow than it was 50 or 60 years ago. Back in the day, you opened the church doors on Sunday morning and people came streaming in. Back in the day, American culture was for us Christians, not against us. Because of these reasons and a thousand more, we should not be discouraged if many people ignore God's good news. Jesus tells us to be ready for that in today's gospel. It happened 2,000 years ago. It will happen today. We are not responsible for the numbers. God is. But it is our responsibility to try to reach out. Salem is an absolutely wonderful place. People out there need a place like this. A place where people share sorrows. A, people, a place where people believe in forgiveness. Where people can have second and third and ten chances. A restful place of shelter from the craziness of life out there. A place here that we people strive out there to make a difference in the world. This is a place where people learn values even more important than those of family and country. Values that people can trust throughout their lives, in a crisis or out. I spoke with Lori Venter this week. She was reminiscing how she came to Salem. She and Mark had been in the area for years when she was invited to the church. What attracted her was that the members that she met were excited about Salem, about the joy of this place. How many of you can tell the same story? Excitement is the best evangelism tool that we have, the best evangelism strategy that anyone can have. Don't all of us want to be the sort of member disciples who make the kind of difference we made in Lori's life and so many other people's? What it boils down to is this. What Jesus is saying in today's Gospel is this. What is keeping you from focusing on God? Whatever it is, put it behind you. Get rid of it. If you can do that, if we can do that, we can be amazed by what God has done through us. Not by our own power, but by the power of God. That is where the excitement of a church comes from. Just like the excitement of the 70 in today's gospel when they found that even the demons obeyed Jesus Christ. So put these ideas of Jesus into practice. Fully practiced, the ideas in today's gospel will change your life. Fully practiced, these ideas can change your church. Even more importantly, Fully practiced, these ideas can change our world. Go on your way today rejoicing. Rejoice in your church. Rejoice in your country. Rejoice in the life that you have in Christ. 
Rejoice in what was done for you when Christ brought you here, whether it was your friends or parents or family or the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice in what you can do to help other people to know that same joy. May it be so.